Chapter 5 Mr. and Mrs. Croft There was dancing that evening at the hotel. Nick Buckley dined there with her friends and waved a gay greeting to us. She was dressed that evening in floating scarlet chiffon that dragged on the floor. Out of it rose her white neck and shoulders and her small, impudent, dark head. An engaging young devil, I remarked. A contrast to her friend, eh? Frederica Rice was in white. She danced with a languorous, weary grace that was as far removed from Nick's animation as anything could be. She is very beautiful, said Poirot suddenly. Who? Ah, Nick? No. The other. Is she evil? Is she good? Is she merely unhappy? One cannot tell. She is a mystery. She is perhaps nothing at all, but I tell you, my friend, she is an allumeuse. What do you mean? I asked curiously. He shook his head, smiling. You will feel it sooner or later. Remember my words. Presently, to my surprise, he rose. Nick was dancing with George Challenger. Frederica and Lazarus had just stopped and had sat down at their table. Then Lazarus got up and went away. Mrs. Rice was alone. Poirot went straight to her table. I followed him. His methods were direct and to the point. Uh, you permit? He laid a hand on the back of a chair, then slid into it. I am anxious to have a word with you while your friend is dancing. Yes? Her voice sounded cool, uninterested. Madame, I do not know whether your friend has told you. If not, I will. Today her life has been attempted. Her great grey eyes widened in horror and surprise. The pupils dilated, black pupils widened too. What do you mean? Mademoiselle Buckley was shot at in the garden of this hotel. She smiled suddenly, a gentle, pitying, incredulous smile. Did Nick tell you, sir? No, madame. I happened to see it with my own eyes. Here is the bullet. He held it out to her, and she drew back a little. Uh, but then, but then, it is no fantasy of Mademoiselle's imagination, you understand. I vouch for that. And there is more. Several very curious accidents have happened in the last few days. You will have heard. No, perhaps you will not. You only arrived here yesterday, did you not? Yes, yesterday. Before that you were staying with friends, I understand, at Tavistock. Yes. I wonder, madame... What were the names of the friends with whom you were staying? She raised her eyebrows. Is there any reason I should tell you that? She asked coldly. Poirot was immediately all innocent surprise. Oh, a thousand pardons, madame. I was most uh, maladroit, but I myself, having friends at Tavistock, fancied that you might have met them there. A Buchanan. That is the name of my friends. Mrs. Rice shook her head. I don't remember them. I don't think I can have met them. Her tone was now quite cordial. Don't let us talk about boring people. Go on about Nick. Who shot at her? Why? I do not know who as yet, said Poirot, but I shall find out. Oh, yes, I shall find out. I am, you know, a detective. Hercule Poirot is my name. A very famous name. Madame is too kind. She said slowly, What do you want me to do? I think she surprised us both there. We had not expected just that. I will ask you, madame, to watch over your friend. I will. That is all. He got up, made a quick bow, and we returned to our own table. Poirot, I said, aren't you showing your hand very plainly? Mon ami, what else can I do? It lacks subtlety, perhaps, but it makes for safety. I can take no chances. At any rate, one thing emerges plain to see. What is that? Mrs. Rice was not at Tavistock. Where was she? Ah, but I will find out. Impossible to keep information from Hercule Poirot. See, the handsome Lazarus has returned. She is telling him. He looks over at us. He is clever, that one. Not the shape of his head. Ah, I wish I knew. What? I asked as he came to a stop. What I shall know on Monday, he returned ambiguously. I looked at him but said nothing. He sighed. You have no longer the curiosity, my friend. In the old days, 
There are some pleasures, I said coldly, that it is good for you to do without. You mean, the pleasure of refusing to answer questions? Ah, si malin, quite so. Ah, well, well, murmured Poirot. The strong, silent man, beloved of novelists in the Edwardian age. His eyes twinkled with their old glint. Nick passed our table shortly afterwards. She detached herself from her partner and swooped down on us like a gaily-coloured bird. Dancing on the edge of death, she said lightly. It is a new sensation, mademoiselle? Yes, rather fun. She was off again with a wave of her hand. I wish she hadn't said that, I said slowly. Dancing on the edge of death. I don't like it. I know. It is too near the truth. She has courage, that little one. Yes, she has courage. But unfortunately it is not courage that is needed at this moment. Caution, not courage. Voilà ce qu'il nous faut. The following day was Sunday. We were sitting on the terrace in front of the hotel, and it was about half-past eleven, when Poirot suddenly rose to his feet. Come, my friend, we will try a little experiment. I have ascertained that Monsieur Lazarus and Madame have gone out in the car, and Mademoiselle with them. The coast is clear. Oh, clear for what? You shall see. We walked down the steps and across a short stretch of grass to the sea. A couple of bathers were coming up it. They passed us laughing and talking. When they had gone, Poirot walked to the point where an inconspicuous small gate, rather rusty on its hinges, bore the words, in half-obliterated letters, End House, Private. There was no one in sight. We passed quietly through. In another minute we came out on the stretch of lawn in front of the house. There was no one about. Poirot strolled to the edge of the cliff and looked over. Then he walked towards the house itself. The French windows onto the veranda were open, and we passed straight into the drawing-room. Poirot wasted no time there. He opened the door and went out into the hall. From there he mounted the stairs, I at his heels. He went straight to Nick's bedroom, sat down on the edge of the bed, and nodded to me with a twinkle. You see, my friend, how easy it is. No one has seen us come. No one will see us go. We could do any little affair we had to do in perfect safety. We could, for instance, fray through a picture wire so that it would be bound to snap before many hours had passed. And supposing that by chance anyone did happen to be in front of the house and see us coming, then we would have a perfectly natural excuse, provided that we were known as friends of the house. Or you mean that we can rule out a stranger? That is what I mean, Hastings. It is no stray lunatic who is at the bottom of this. We must look nearer home than that. He turned to leave the room, and I followed him. We neither of us spoke. We were both, I think, troubled in mind. And then, at the bend of the staircase, we both stopped abruptly. A man was coming up. He, too, stopped. His face was in shadow, but his attitude was one of one completely taken aback. He was the first to speak, in a loud, rather bullying voice. "'What the hell are you doing here? I'd like to know.' "'Ah,' said Poirot, "'Monsieur Croft, I think. Well, that's my name. But what—' "'Shall we go into the drawing-room to converse? It would be better, I think.' The other gave way, turned abruptly, and descended, we following close on his heels. In the drawing-room, with the door shut, Poirot made a little bow. "'I will introduce myself, Hercule Poirot, at your service.' The other's face cleared a little. "'Oh,' he said slowly, "'you're the detective chap. I've read about you.' "'In the St. Lou Herald.' "'Huh? Oh, I've read about you way back in Australia. French, aren't you?' A Belgian. It makes no matter. This is my friend, Captain Hastings. Oh, glad to meet you. But look, what's the big idea? What are you doing here? Anything wrong? It depends what you call wrong. The Australian nodded. He was a fine-looking man in spite of his bald head and advancing years. His physique was magnificent. He had a heavy, rather underhung face. A crude face, I called it to myself. The piercing blue of his eyes was the most noticeable thing about him. "'See here,' he said. "'I came round to bring little Miss Buckley a handful of tomatoes and a cucumber. That man of hers is no good. Bone idle. Doesn't grow a thing. Lazy hound. Mother and I, why, oh, it makes us mad, and we feel it's only neighbourly to do what we can. We've got a lot more tomatoes than we can eat. 
Neighbours should be matey, don't you think? I came in as usual through the window and dumped the basket down. I was just going off again when I heard footsteps and men's voices overhead. That struck me as odd. We don't deal much in burglars round here, but after all it was possible. I thought I'd just make sure everything was all right. Then I met you two on the stairs coming down. Gave me a bit of a surprise. And now you tell me you're a bonza detective. What's it all about? It is very simple, said Poirot, smiling. Mademoiselle had a rather alarming experience the other night. A picture fell above her bed. She may have told you of it. Well, she did. A mighty fine escape. To make all secure, I promised to bring her some special chain. It will not do to repeat the occurrence, eh? She tells me she is going out this morning, but I may come and measure what amount of chain will be needed. Voila, it is simple. He flung out his hands with a childlike simplicity and his most engaging smile. Croft drew a deep breath. So, that's all, is it? Yes, you have had the scare for nothing. We are very law-abiding citizens, my friend and I. Didn't I see you yesterday? said Croft, slowly. Yesterday evening it was. You passed our little place. Ah, yes, you were working in the garden, and were so polite as to say good afternoon when we passed. Ah, that's right. Well, well, and you're the Monsieur Hercule Poirot I've heard so much about. Tell me, are you busy, Mr. Poirot? Because if not, I wish you'd come back with me now. Have a cup of morning tea, Australian fashion, and meet my old lady. She's read all about you in the newspapers. You are too kind, Monsieur Croft. We have nothing to do, and shall be delighted. Oh, that's fine. You have the measurements correctly, Hastings? asked Poirot, turning to me. I assured him that I had the measurements correctly, and we accompanied our new friend. Croft was a talker. We soon realized that. He told us of his home near Melbourne, of his early struggles, of his meeting with his wife, of their combined efforts, and of his final good fortune and success. Right away we made up our minds to travel, he said. We'd always wanted to come to the old country. Well, we did. We came down to this part of the world, tried to look up some of my wife's people. They came from round about here, but we couldn't trace any of them. Then we took a trip on the continent. Paris, Rome, the Italian lakes, Florence, all those places. It was while we were in Italy that we had the train accident. My poor wife was badly smashed up. Cruel, wasn't it? I've taken her to the best doctors, and they all say the same. There's nothing for it but time. Time and lying up. It's an injury to the spine. What a misfortune. Hard luck, isn't it? Well, there it was, and she'd only got one kind of fancy, to come down here. She kind of felt, if we had a little place of our own, something small, it would make all the difference. We saw a lot of messy-looking shacks, and then, by good luck, we found this. Nice and quiet and tucked away, no cars passing or gramophones next door. I took it right away. With the last words, we had come to the lodge itself. He sent his voice echoing forth in a loud coo to which came an answering coo "'Come in,' said Mr. Croft. He passed through the open door and up the short flight of stairs to a pleasant bedroom. There, on a sofa, was a stout, middle-aged woman with pretty grey hair and a very sweet smile. "'Who do you think this is, mother?' said Mr. Croft. "'The extra-special, world-celebrated detective, Mr. Hercule Poirot. "'I brought him right along to have a chat with you.' "'Ah, if that isn't too exciting for words,' cried Mrs. Croft, "'shaking Poirot warmly by the hand. "'Read about that blue train business I did, "'and you just happening to be on it, "'and a lot about your other cases. "'Since this trouble with my back, "'I've read all the detective stories that ever were, I should think.' Nothing else seems to pass the time away so quick. Bird, dear, call out to Edith to bring the tea along. Right you are, mother. She's a kind of nurse attendant, Edith is, Mrs. Croft explained. She comes along each morning to fix me up. We're not bothering with servants. Bert's as good a cook and a house parliament as you'll find anywhere, and it gives him occupation. That and the garden. Here we are, cried Mr. Croft, reappearing with a tray. Here's the tea. This is a great day in our lives, mother. I suppose you're staying down here, Mr. Poirot? Mrs. Croft asked, as she leaned over a little and wielded the teapot. Why, yes, madame, I take the holiday. But surely I read that you'd retired, that you'd taken a holiday for good and all. 
Ah, madame, you must not believe everything you read in the papers. Well, that's true enough. So, you still carry on business? When I find a case that interests me. Sure you're not down here on work? inquired Mr. Croft shrewdly. Calling it a holiday might be all part of the game. You mustn't ask him embarrassing questions, Bert, said Mrs. Croft, or he won't come again. We're simple people, Mr. Poirot, and you're giving us a great treat coming here today, you and your friend. You really don't know the pleasure you're giving us. She was so natural and so frank in her gratification that my heart quite warmed to her. That was a bad business about that picture, said Mr. Croft. That poor little girl might have been killed, said Mrs. Croft with deep feeling. She is a live wire, livens the place up when she comes down here. Not much liked in the neighbourhood, so I've heard. But that's the way in these stuck English places. They don't like life and gaiety in a girl. I don't wonder she doesn't spend much time down here. And that long-nosed cousin of hers has no more chance of persuading her to settle down here for good and all than... than... well, I don't know what. Don't gossip, Milly, said her husband. Aha, said Poirot. The wind is in that quarter. Trust the instinct of madame. So... Monsieur Charles Vyse is in love with our little friend. Oh, he's silly about her, said Mrs. Croft, but she won't marry a country lawyer, and I don't blame her. He's a poor stick anyway. I'd like her to marry that nice sailor. What's his name? The Challenger. Many a smart marriage might be worse than that. He's older than she is, but what of that? Steadying, that's what she needs. Flying about all over the place, the continent even, all alone, or with that queer-looking Mrs. Rice. She's a sweet girl, Mr. Poirot. I know that well enough, but I'm worried about her. She's looked none too happy lately. She's had what I call a haunted kind of look, and that worries me. I've got my reasons for being interested in that girl, haven't I, Bert? Mr. Croft got up from his chair rather suddenly. No need to go into that, Milly, he said. I wonder, Mr. Poirot, if you'd care to see some uh, snapshots of Australia. The rest of our visit passed uneventfully. Ten minutes later we took our leave. Nice people, I said, so simple and unassuming. Typical Australians. You liked them? Well, didn't you? They were very pleasant, very friendly. Well, what is it, then? There's something I can see. They were perhaps just a shade too typical, said Poirot thoughtfully. That cry of cooey, that insistence on showing us snapshots. Was it not playing a part, just a little too thoroughly? What a suspicious old devil you are! You are right, mon ami. I am suspicious of everyone, of everything. I am afraid, Hastings. Afraid. Chapter 6 A Call Upon Mr. Vyse Poirot clung firmly to the continental breakfast. To see me consuming eggs and bacon upset and distressed him, so he always said, Consequently, he breakfasted in bed upon coffee and rolls, and I was free to start the day with the traditional Englishman's breakfast of bacon and eggs and marmalade. I looked into his room on Monday morning as I went downstairs. He was sitting up in bed, arrayed in a very marvellous dressing-gown. Bonjour, Hastings. I was just about to ring. Uh, this note that I have written, will you be so good as to get it taken over to End House and delivered to Mademoiselle at once? I held out my hand for it. Poirot looked at me and sighed. If only, if only, Hastings, you would part your hair in the middle instead of at the side. What a difference it would make to the symmetry of your appearance. And your moustache. If you must have a moustache, let it be a real moustache, a thing of beauty such as mine. Repressing a shudder at the thought, I took the note firmly from Poirot's hand and left the room. I had rejoined him in our sitting-room, when word was sent up to say Miss Buckley had called. Poirot gave the order for her to be shown up. She came in gaily enough, but I fancied that the circles under her eyes were darker than usual. In her hand she held a telegram, which she handed to Poirot. There, she said, I hope that will please you. Poirot read it aloud. Arrive at five-thirty today, Maggie. My nurse and guardian, said Nick, but you're wrong, you know. Maggie's got no kind of brains. Good works is about all she's fit for. That and never seeing the point of jokes. Freddy would be ten times better at spotting hidden assassins, and Jim Lazarus would be better still. I never feel one has got to the bottom of Jim. And the Commander Challenger? 
Oh, George! He'd never see anything until it was under his nose. But he'd let them have it when he did see. Very useful when it came to a showdown, George would be. She tossed off her hat and went on. I gave orders for the man you wrote about to be let in. It sounds mysterious. Is he installing a dictaphone or something like that? Poirot shook his head. No, no, nothing scientific. A very simple little matter of opinion, Mademoiselle. Something I wanted to know. Oh, well, said Nick. It's all great fun, isn't it? Is it, Mademoiselle? asked Poirot gently. She stood for a minute with her back to us, looking out of the window. Then she turned. All the brave defiance had gone out of her face. It was childishly twisted awry as she struggled to keep back the tears. No, she said, it, it isn't really. I'm afraid. I'm afraid, hideously afraid. And I always thought I was brave. So you are, mon enfant, so you are. Both Hastings and I, we have both admired your courage. Yes, indeed, I put in warmly. No, said Nick, shaking her head. I'm not brave. It's... It's the waiting, wondering the whole time if anything more is going to happen, and how it'll happen, and expecting it to happen. Yes, yes, it is the strain. Last night I pulled my bed out into the middle of the room and fastened my window and bolted my door. When I came here this morning, I came round by the road. I, I couldn't. I simply couldn't come through the garden. It's as though my nerve had gone all of a sudden. It's this thing coming on top of everything else. What do you mean exactly by that, mademoiselle? on top of everything else. There was a momentary pause before she replied, I don't mean anything in particular. What the newspapers call the strain of modern life, I suppose. Too many cocktails, too many cigarettes, all that sort of thing. It's just that I've got into a ridiculous sort of... of state. She had sunk into a chair and was sitting there, her small fingers curling and uncurling themselves nervously. You are not being frank with me, mademoiselle. There is something. There isn't. There really isn't. There is something you have not told me. I've told you every single smallest thing. She spoke sincerely and earnestly. About these accidents, about the attacks upon you, yes. Well, then? But you have not told me everything that is in your heart, in your life. She said slowly, Can anyone do that? Ah, then, said Poirot, with triumph, you admit it. She shook her head. He watched her keenly. Perhaps, he suggested shrewdly, it is not your secret. I thought I saw a momentary flicker of her eyelids, but almost immediately she jumped up. Really and truly, Monsieur Poirot, I've told you every single thing I know about this stupid business. If you think I know something about someone else or have suspicions, you're wrong. It's having no suspicions that's driving me mad. Because I'm not a fool, I can see that if those accidents weren't accidents, they must have been engineered by somebody very near at hand, somebody who knows me. And that's what's so awful, because I haven't the least idea, not the very least, who that somebody might be. She went over once more to the window and stood looking out. Poirot signed to me not to speak. I think he was hoping for some further revelation now that the girl's self-control had broken down. When she spoke, it was in a different tone of voice, a dreamy, faraway voice. Do you know a queer wish I've always had? I love Aunt House. I've always wanted to produce a play there. It's got an, an atmosphere of drama about it. I've seen all sorts of plays staged there in my mind, and now it's as though a drama were being acted there. Only I'm not producing it. I'm in it. I'm right in it. I am, perhaps, the person who dies in the first act. Her voice broke. Now, now, mademoiselle. Poirot's voice was resolutely brisk and cheerful. This will not do. This is hysteria. She turned and looked at him sharply. Did Freddy tell you I was hysterical? She asked. She says I am sometimes, but you mustn't always believe what Freddy says. There are times, you know, when... when she isn't quite herself. There was a pause. Then Poirot asked a totally irrelevant question. Tell me, mademoiselle, he said, have you ever received an offer for End House? Or to sell it, do you mean? That is what I meant. No. Would you consider selling it if you got a good offer? Nick considered for a moment. No, I don't think so. Not, I mean, unless it was such a ridiculously good offer that it would be perfectly foolish not to. Précisément. I don't want to sell it, you know, because I'm fond of it. Quite so. 
I understand. Nick moved slowly towards the door. Oh, by the way, there are fireworks tonight. Will you come? Dinner at eight o'clock. The fireworks begin at nine-thirty. You can see them splendidly from the garden where it overlooks the harbour. I shall be enchanted. Both of you, of course, said Nick. Oh, many thanks, I said. Nothing like a party for reviving the drooping spirits, remarked Nick, and with a little laugh she went out. Pauvre enfant, said Poirot. He reached for his hat and carefully flicked an infinitesimal speck of dust from its surface. We're going out, I asked. Mais oui. We have legal business to transact, mon ami. Of course, I understand. One of your brilliant mentality could not fail to do so, Hastings. The offices of Messrs. Vise, Trevanian, and Winard were situated in the main street of the town. We mounted the stairs to the first floor and entered a room where three clerks were busily writing. Poirot asked to see Mr. Charles Vise. A clerk murmured a few words down a telephone, received apparently an affirmative reply, and remarking that Mr. Vise would see us now, he led us across the passage, tapped on a door, and stood aside for us to pass in. From behind a large desk covered with legal papers, Mr. Vise rose up to greet us. He was a tall young man, rather pale, with impassive features. He was going a little bald on either temple, and wore glasses. His colouring was fair and indeterminate. Poirot had come prepared for the encounter. Fortunately, he had with him an agreement, as yet unsigned, and so, on some technical points in connection with this, he wanted Mr. Vise's advice. Mr. Vise, speaking carefully and correctly, was soon able to allay Poirot's alleged doubts and to clear up some obscure points of the wording. I am very much obliged to you, murmured Poirot. As a foreigner, you comprehend these legal matters and phrasings are most difficult. It was then that Mr. Vise asked who had sent Poirot to him. A Miss Buckley, said Poirot promptly. Your cousin, is she not? A most charming young lady. I happened to mention that I was in perplexity, and she told me to come to you. I tried to see you on Saturday morning, about half-past twelve, but you were out. Yes, I remember. I left early on Saturday. Mademoiselle, your cousin must find that large house very lonely. She lives there alone, I understand. Quite so. Tell me, Mr. Vise, if I may ask, is there any chance of that property being in the market? Oh, not the least, I should say. You understand I do not ask idly. I have a reason. I am in search myself of just such a property. The climate of St. Louis enchants me. It is true that the house appears to be in bad repair. There has not been, I gather, much money to spend upon it. Under those circumstances, is it not possible that Mademoiselle would consider an offer? Not the least likelihood of it. Charles Vise shook his head with the utmost decision. My cousin is absolutely devoted to the place. Nothing would induce her to sell, I know. It is, you understand, a family place. I comprehend that, but it is absolutely out of the question. I know my cousin. She has a fanatical devotion to the house. A few minutes later we were out in the street again. Well, my friend, said Poirot, and what impression did this Monsieur Charles Vise make upon you? I considered. A very negative one. I said at last, he is a curiously negative person. Not a strong personality, you would say. No, indeed. The kind of man you would never remember on meeting him again. A mediocre person. His appearance is certainly not striking. Did you notice any discrepancy in the course of our conversation with him? Yes, I said slowly. I did. With regard to the selling of End House. Exactly. Would you have described Mademoiselle Buckley's attitude towards End House as one of fanatical devotion? <laughs> it's a very strong term. Yes. And Mr. Vise is not given to using strong terms. His normal attitude, a legal attitude, is to under rather than overstate. Yet he says that Mademoiselle has a fanatical devotion to the home of her ancestors. She did not convey that impression this morning, I said. She spoke about it very sensibly, I thought. She's obviously fond of the place, just as anyone in her position would be, but certainly nothing more. So, in fact, one of the two is lying, said Poirot thoughtfully. One would not suspect Vise of lying. Clearly a great asset, if one has any lying to do, remarked Poirot. 
Yes, he has quite the air of a George Washington, that one. Did you notice another thing, Hastings? What was that? He was not in his office at half-past twelve on Saturday. Chapter 7 Tragedy The first person we saw when we arrived at End House that evening was Nick. She was dancing about the hall, wrapped in a marvellous kimono covered with dragons. Oh, it's only you, mademoiselle. I am desolated. I know it did sound rude, but you see, I'm waiting for my dress to arrive. They promised the brutes, promised faithfully. Ah, if it is a matter of la toilette. There is a dance tonight, is there not? Yes, we're all going on to it after the fireworks. That is, I suppose we are. There was a sudden drop in her voice, but the next minute she was laughing. Never give in, that's my motto. Don't think of trouble and trouble won't come. I've got my nerve back tonight. I'm going to be gay and enjoy myself. There was a footfall on the stairs. Nick turned. Oh, here's Maggie. Maggie, here are the sleuths that are protecting me from the secret assassin. Take them into the drawing room and let them tell you about it. In turn, we shook hands with Maggie Buckley, and as requested, she took us into the drawing room. I formed an immediate favourable opinion of her. It was, I think, her appearance of calm good sense that so attracted me. A quiet girl, pretty in the old-fashioned sense, certainly not smart. Her face was innocent of makeup, and she wore a simple, rather shabby black evening dress. She had frank blue eyes and a pleasant, slow voice. Nick has been telling me the most amazing things, she said. Surely she must be exaggerating. Whoever would want to harm Nick? She can't have an enemy in the world. Incredulity showed strongly in her voice. She was looking at Poirot in a somewhat unflattering fashion. I realized that to a girl like Maggie Buckley, foreigners were always suspicious. Nevertheless, Miss Buckley, I assure you that it is the truth, said Poirot quietly. She made no reply, but her face remained unbelieving. Nick seems quite fey tonight, she remarked. I don't know what's the matter with her. She seems in the wildest spirits. That word, fey, it sent a shiver through me. Also, something in the intonation of her voice had set me wondering. Are you Scotch, Miss Buckley? I asked abruptly. Oh, my mother was Scottish, she explained. She viewed me, I noticed, with more approval than she viewed Poirot. I felt that my statement of the case would carry more weight with her than Poirot's would. Your cousin is behaving with great bravery, I said. She's determined to carry on as usual. It's the only way, isn't it? said Maggie. I mean, whatever one's inward feelings are, it's no good making a fuss about them. That's only uncomfortable for everyone else. She paused, and then added in a soft voice, I'm very fond of Nick. She's been good to me always. We could say nothing more, for at that moment Frederica Rice drifted into the room. She was wearing a gown of Madonna blue, and looked very fragile and ethereal. Lazarus soon followed her, and then Nick danced in. She was wearing a black frock, and round her was wrapped a marvellous old Chinese shawl of vivid lacquer red. Hello, people! she said. Cocktails? We all drank, and Lazarus raised his glass to her. That's a marvellous shawl, Nick, he said. It's an old one, isn't it? Yes, brought back by great-great-great-uncle Timothy from his travels. It's a beauty, a real beauty. You wouldn't find another to match it if you tried. It's warm, said Nick. It'll be nice when we're watching the fireworks. And it's gay. I, I hate black. Yes, said Frederica. I don't believe I've ever seen you in a black dress before, Nick. Why did you get it? Oh, I don't know, the girl flung aside with a petulant gesture, but I had caught a curious curl of her lips as though of pain. Why does one do anything? We went into dinner. A mysterious manservant had appeared, hired, I presumed, for the occasion. The food was indifferent. The champagne, on the other hand, was good. George hasn't turned up, said Nick. A nuisance is having to go back to Plymouth last night. He'll get over this evening some time or other, I expect. In time for the dance, anyway. I've got a man for Maggie. Presentable, if not passionately interesting. A faint roaring sound drifted in through the window. Ah, oh, curse that speedboat, said Lazarus. I get so tired of it. That's not the speedboat, said Nick. That's a seaplane. I believe you're right. Of course I'm right. 
The sound's quite different. When are you going to get your mouth, Nick? When I can raise the money, laughed Nick. And then I suppose you'll be off to Australia, like that girl. What's her name? I'd love to. I admire her enormously, said Mrs. Rice in her tired voice. What marvellous nerve. All by herself, too. I admire all these flying people, said Lazarus. If Michael Seaton had succeeded in his flight round the world, he'd have been the hero of the day, and rightly so. A thousand pities he's come to grief. He's the kind of man England can't afford to lose. He may still be all right, said Nick. Hardly. It's a thousand to one against by now. Poor Mad Seaton. They always called him Mad Seaton, didn't they? asked Frederica. Lazarus nodded. He comes of rather a mad family, he said. His uncle, Sir Matthew Seaton, who died about a week ago, he was as mad as a hatter. He was the mad millionaire who ran bird sanctuaries, wasn't he? asked Frederica. Yes, he used to buy up islands. He was a great woman-hater. Some girl chucked him once, I believe, and he took to natural history by way of consoling himself. Why do you say Michael Seaton is dead? persisted Nick. I don't see any reason for giving up hope. Yet. Of course, you knew him, didn't you? said Lazarus. I forgot. Freddy and I met him at Latouquet last year, said Nick. He was too marvellous, wasn't he, Freddy? Don't ask me, darling. He was your conquest, not mine. He took you up once, didn't he? Yes, at Scarborough. It was simply too wonderful. Have you done any flying, Captain Hastings? Maggie asked me in polite conversational tones. I had to confess that a trip to Paris and back was the extent of my acquaintance with air travel. Suddenly, with an exclamation, Nick sprang up. That's the telephone. Don't wait for me. It's getting late, and I've asked lots of people. She left the room. I glanced at my watch. It was just nine o'clock. Dessert was brought, and port. Poirot and Lazarus were talking art. Pictures, Lazarus was saying, were a great drug in the market just now. They went on to discuss new ideas in furniture and decoration. I endeavoured to do my duty by talking to Maggie Buckley, but I had to admit that the girl was heavy in hand. She answered pleasantly, but without throwing the ball back. It was uphill work. Frederica Rice sat dreamily silent, her elbows on the table, and the smoke from her cigarette curling round her fair head. She looked like a meditative angel. It was just twenty past nine when Nick put her head round the door. Come out of it, all of you. The animals are coming in two by two. We rose obediently. Nick was busy greeting arrivals. About a dozen people had been asked. Most of them were rather uninteresting. Nick, I noticed, made a good hostess. She sank her modernisms and made everyone welcome in an old-fashioned way. Among the guests, I noticed Charles Vyse. Presently, we all moved out into the garden, to a place overlooking the sea and the harbour. A few chairs had been placed there for the elderly people, but most of us stood. The first rocket flamed to heaven. At that moment I heard a loud, familiar voice, and turned my head to see Nick greeting Mr. Croft. "'It's too bad,' she was saying, "'that Mrs. Croft can't be here, too. We ought to have carried her on a stretcher or something. Ah, it's bad luck on poor mother altogether. But she never complains.' That woman's got the sweetest nature. Ha! <laughs> that's a good one! This as a shower of golden rain showed up in the sky. The night was a dark one. There was no moon, the new moon being due in three days' time. It was also, like most summer evenings, cold. Maggie Buckley, who was next to me, shivered. I'll just run in and get a coat, she murmured. Oh, let me! No, you wouldn't know where to find it. She turned towards the house. At that moment, Frederica Rice's voice called, Oh, Maggie, get mine, too. It's in my room. She didn't hear, said Nick. I'll get it, Freddy. I want my fur one. This shawl isn't nearly hot enough. It's this wind. There was indeed a sharp breeze blowing off the sea. Some set pieces started down on the quay. I fell into conversation with an elderly lady standing next to me, who put me through a rigorous catechism as to life, career, tastes, and probable length of stay. Bang! A shower of green stars filled the sky. They changed to blue, then red, then silver. Another, and yet another. Oh, and then 
Ah, that is what one says, observed Poirot, suddenly close to my ear. At the end it becomes monotonous, do you not find? <laughs> the grass, it is damp to the feet. I shall suffer for this, a chill, and no possibility of obtaining a proper design. A chill on a lovely night like this? A lovely night, a lovely night. You say that because the rain, it does not pour down in sheets. Always when the rain does not fall, it is a lovely night. But I tell you, my friend, if there were a little thermometer to consult, you would see. Well, I admitted, I wouldn't mind putting on a coat myself. You are very sensible. You have come from a hot climate. I'll bring yours. Poirot lifted first one and then the other foot from the ground with a cat-like motion. It is the dampness of the feet, I fear. Would it think you'll be possible to lay hands on a pair of goloshes? I repressed a smile. Not a hope, I said. You understand, Poirot, that it is no longer done. Then I shall sit in the house, he declared. Just for the Guy Fawkes show, shall I want only enrhume myself, and catch, perhaps, a fluxion de poitrine? Poirot, still murmuring indignantly, we bent our footsteps towards the house. Loud clapping drifted up to us from the quay below, where another set piece was being shown. A ship, I believe, with welcome to our visitors displayed across it. We are all children at heart, said Poirot thoughtfully. Les feux d'artifice, the party, the games with balls, yes, and even the conjurer, the man who deceives the eye, however carefully it watches. Mais qu'est-ce que vous avez? I had caught him by the arm and was clutching him with one hand, while with the other I pointed. We were within a hundred yards of the house, and just in front of us, between us and the open French window, there lay a huddled figure, wrapped in a scarlet Chinese shawl. Mon Dieu! whispered Poirot. Mon Dieu! Chapter 8 The Fatal Shawl I suppose it was not more than forty seconds that we stood there, frozen with horror, unable to move, but it seemed like an hour. Then Poirot moved forward, shaking off my hand. He moved stiffly, like an automaton. It has happened, he murmured, and I can hardly describe the anguished bitterness of his voice. In spite of everything, in spite of all my precautions, it has happened. Ah! Miserable criminal that I am, why did I not guard her better? I should have foreseen, not for one instant, should I have left her side. Well, you mustn't blame yourself, I said. My tongue stuck to the roof of my mouth, and I could hardly articulate. Poirot only responded with a sorrowful shake of his head. He knelt down by the body. And at that moment we received a second shock. For Nick's voice rang out clear and gay, and a moment later Nick appeared in the square of the window, silhouetted against the lighted room behind. Sorry I've been so long, Maggie, she said, but... Then she broke off, staring at the scene before her. With a sharp exclamation, Poirot turned over the body on the lawn, and I pressed forward to see. I looked down into the dead face of Maggie Buckley. In another minute, Nick was beside us. She gave a sharp cry. Maggie! Oh, Maggie! It... it can't... Poirot was still examining the girl's body. At last, very slowly, he rose to his feet. Is she... is... Nick's voice broke off. Yes, mademoiselle. She is dead. But why? But why? Who could have wanted to kill her? Poirot's reply came quickly and firmly. It was not her they meant to kill, mademoiselle. It was you. They were misled by the shawl. A great cry broke from Nick. Why couldn't it have been me? she wailed. Oh, why couldn't it have been me? I'd so much rather. I don't want to live now. I'd be glad, willing, happy to die. She flung up her arms wildly and then staggered slightly. I passed an arm round her quickly to support her. Take her into the house, Hastings, said Poirot. Then ring up the police. The police? May we? Tell them someone has been shot, and afterwards stay with Mademoiselle Nick. On no account, leave her. I nodded comprehension of these instructions, and supporting the half-fainting girl, made my way through the drawing-room window. I laid the girl on the sofa there, with a cushion under her head, and then hurried out into the hall in search of the telephone. I gave a slight start, or almost running into Ellen. She was standing there with a the most peculiar expression on her meek, respectable face. 
Her eyes were glittering, and she was passing her tongue repeatedly over her dry lips. Her hands were trembling as though with excitement. As soon as she saw me, she spoke. As, has anything happened, sir? Yes, I said curtly. Where's the telephone? Nothing, nothing wrong, sir. There's been an accident, I said evasively. Somebody hurt. I must telephone. Who has been hurt, sir? There was a positive eagerness in her face. Miss Buckley. Miss Maggie Buckley. Miss Maggie? Miss Maggie? Are you sure, sir? I mean, are you sure that... that it's Miss Maggie? I'm quite sure, I said. Why? Oh, nothing. I... I thought it might be one of the other ladies. I thought perhaps it might be Mrs. Rice. Look here, I said. Where's the telephone? It's in the little room here, sir. She opened the door for me and indicated the instrument. Thanks, I said. And as she seemed disposed to linger, I added, That's all I want, thank you. If you want Dr. Graham... No, no, I said. That's all. Go, please. She withdrew reluctantly, as slowly as she dared. In all probability, she would listen outside the door, but I could not help that. After all, she would soon know all there was to be known. I got the police station and made my report. Then, on my own initiative, I rang up the Dr. Graham Ellen had mentioned. I found his number in the book. Nick, at any rate, should have medical attention, I felt, even though a doctor could do nothing for that poor girl lying out there. He promised to come at once, and I hung up the receiver and came out into the hall again. If Ellen had been listening outside the door, she had managed to disappear very swiftly. There was no one in sight when I came out. I went back into the drawing-room. Nick was trying to sit up. Do you think... Could you get me... some brandy? Of course. I hurried into the dining-room, found what I wanted, and came back. A few sips of the spirit revived the girl. The colour began to come back into her cheeks. I rearranged the cushion for her head. It's all so awful, she shivered. Everything. Everywhere. I know, my dear, I know. No, you don't. You can't. And it's all such a waste. If it were only me, it would be all over. You mustn't, I said. Be morbid. She only shook her head and reiterated, You don't know. You don't know. Then suddenly she began to cry, a quiet, hopeless sobbing like a child. That, I thought, was probably the best thing for her, so I made no effort to stem her tears. When their first violence had died down a little, I stole across to the window and looked out. I had heard an outcry of voices a few minutes before. They were all there by now, a semicircle round the scene of the tragedy, with Poirot like a fantastical sentinel keeping them back. As I watched, two uniformed figures came striding across the grass. The police had arrived. I went quietly back to my place by the sofa. Nick lifted her tear-stained face. Oughtn't I to be doing something? No, my dear. Poirot will see to it. Leave it to him. Nick was silent for a minute or two. Then she said, Poor Maggie. Poor dear old Maggie. Such a good sort who never harmed a soul in her life. That this should happen to her. I feel as though I'd killed her, bringing her down in the way that I did. I shook my head sadly. How little one can foresee the future. When Poirot insisted on Nick's inviting a friend, how little did he think that he was signing an unknown girl's death warrant? We sat in silence. I longed to know what was going on outside, but I loyally fulfilled Poirot's instructions and stuck to my post. It seemed hours later when the door opened and Poirot and a police inspector entered the room. With them came a man who was evidently Dr. Graham. He came over at once to Nick. And how are you feeling, Miss Buckley? This must have been a terrible shock. His fingers were on her pulse. Not too bad. He turned to me. Has she had anything? Some brandy, I said. I'm all right, said Nick bravely. Able to answer a few questions, eh? Of course. The police inspector moved forward with a preliminary cough. Nick greeted him with the ghost of a smile. Not impeding the traffic this time, she said. I gathered that they were not strangers to each other. This is a terrible business, Miss Buckley, 
said the inspector. I'm very sorry about it. Now, Mr. Poirot here, whose name I'm very familiar with, and proud we are to have him with us, I'm sure, tells me that to the best of his belief you were shot at in the grounds of the Majestic Hotel the other morning. Nick nodded. I thought it was just a wasp, she explained. But it wasn't. And you'd had some rather peculiar accidents before that. Yes, at least. It was odd their happening so close together. She gave a brief account of the various circumstances. Just so. Now, how came it that your cousin was wearing your shawl tonight? We came in to fetch her coat. It was rather cold watching the fireworks. I flung off the shawl on the sofa here. Then I went upstairs and put on the coat I'm wearing now, a light nutria one. I also got a wrap for my friend Mrs. Rice out of her room. There it is on the floor, by the window. Then Maggie called out that she couldn't find her coat. I said it must be downstairs. She went down and called up she still couldn't find it. I said it must have been left in the car. It was a tweed coat she was looking for. She hasn't got an evening furry one, and I said I'd bring her down something of mine. But she said it didn't matter, she'd take my shawl if I didn't want it. And I said, of course, but would that be enough? And she said, oh, yes, because she really didn't feel it particularly cold after Yorkshire, she just wanted something. And I said, all right, I'd be out in a minute, and when I did, when I did come out, she stopped, her voice breaking. Now, don't distress yourself, Miss Buckley. Just tell me this. Did you hear a shot or two shots? Nick shook her head. No, only just the fireworks popping and the squibs going off. That's just it, said the inspector. You'd never notice a shot with all that going on. It's no good asking you, I suppose, if you've any clue to who it is making these attacks upon you. I haven't the least idea, said Nick. I can't imagine. And you wouldn't be likely to, said the inspector. Some homicidal maniac. That's what it looks like to me. Nasty business. Well, I won't need to ask you any more questions tonight, miss. I'm more sorry about this than I can say. Dr. Graham stepped forward. I'm going to suggest, Miss Buckley, that you don't stay here. I've been talking it over with Monsieur Poirot. I know of an excellent nursing home. You've had a shock, you know. What you need is complete rest. Nick was not looking at him. Her eyes had gone to Poirot. Is it because of the shock? she asked. He came forward. I want you to feel safe, mon enfant, and I want to feel too that you are safe. There will be a nurse there, a nice, uh, practical, unimaginative nurse. She will be near you all night. When you wake up and cry out, she will be there, close at hand. You understand? Yes, said Nick. I understand, but you don't. I'm not afraid any longer. I don't care one way or another. If anyone wants to murder me, they can. Hush, hush, I said. You're overstrung. You don't know. None of you know. I really think Monsieur Poirot's plan is a good one, the doctor broke in soothingly. I will take you in my car, and we will give you a little something to ensure a good night's rest. Now, what do you say? I don't mind, said Nick. Anything you like. It doesn't matter. Poirot laid his hand on hers. I know, mademoiselle. I know what you must feel. I stand before you ashamed and stricken to the heart. I, who promised protection, have not been able to protect. I have failed. I am miserable, but believe me, mademoiselle, my heart is in agony because of that failure. If you knew what I am suffering, you would forgive, I am sure. That's all right, said Nick, still in the same dull voice. You mustn't blame yourself. I'm sure you did the best you could. Nobody could have helped it, or done more, I'm sure. Please don't be unhappy. You are very generous, mademoiselle. No, I... There was an interruption. The door flew open, and George Challenger rushed into the room. What's all this? he cried. 
I've just arrived to find a policeman at the gate, and a rumour that somebody's dead. What is it all about? For God's sake, tell me. Is it... is it Nick? The anguish in his tone was dreadful to hear. I suddenly realised that Poirot and the doctor between them completely blotted out Nick from his sight. Before anyone had time to answer, he repeated his question. Tell me! It can't be true! Nick isn't dead! No, mon ami, said Poirot gently. She is alive and he drew back so that Challenger could see the little figure on the sofa. For a moment or two, Challenger stared at her incredulously. Then, staggering a little, like a drunken man, he muttered, Nick! Nick! And suddenly, dropping on his knees beside the sofa and hiding his head in his hands, he cried in a muffled voice, Nick! My darling! I thought that you were dead! Nick tried to sit up. It's all right, George. Don't be an idiot. I'm quite safe. He raised his head and looked round wildly. But somebody's dead. The policeman said so. Yes, said Nick. Maggie. Poor old Maggie. Oh! A spasm twisted her face. The doctor and Poirot came forward. Graham helped her to her feet. He and Poirot, one on each side, helped her from the room. The sooner you get to your bed, the better, remarked the doctor. I'll take you along at once in my car. I've asked Mrs. Rice to pack a few things ready for you to take. They disappeared through the door. Challenger caught my arm. I don't understand. Where are they taking her? I explained. Oh, I see. Now then, Hastings, for God's sake, give me the hang of this thing. What a ghastly tragedy. That poor girl. Come and have a drink, I said. You're all to pieces. I don't mind if I do. We adjourned to the dining room. You see, he explained as he put away a stiff whisky and soda, I thought it was Nick. There was very little doubt as to the feelings of Commander George Challenger. A more transparent lover never lived. Chapter 9 A to J I doubt if I shall ever forget the night that followed. Poirot was a prey to such an agony of self-reproach that I was really alarmed. Ceaselessly he strode up and down the room, heaping anathemas on his own head, and deaf to my well-meant remonstrances. What it is to have too good an opinion of oneself. I am punished. Yes, I am punished. I, Hercule Poirot, I, I was too sure of myself. No, no, I interpolated. But who would imagine? Who could imagine such unparalleled audacity? I had taken, as I thought, all possible precautions. I had warned the murderer. Warned the murderer? Mais oui. I had drawn attention to myself. I had let him see that I suspected someone. I had made it, or so I thought, too dangerous for him to dare to repeat his attempts at murder. I had drawn a cordon round Mademoiselle, and he slips through it boldly. Under our very eyes, almost, he slips through it. In spite of us all, of everyone being on the alert, he achieves his object. Only he doesn't. I reminded him. Oh, that is the chance only. From my point of view, it is the same. A human life has been taken, Hastings. Oh, well, of course, I said. I didn't mean that. But on the other hand, what you say is true, and that makes it worse. Ten times worse, for the murderer is still as far as ever from achieving his object. Do you understand, my friend? The position is changed for the worse. It may mean that not one life, but two, will be sacrificed. Not while you're about, I said stoutly. He stopped and wrung my hand. Merci, mon ami. Merci. You still have confidence in the old one. You still have the faith. You put new courage into me. Hercule Poirot will not fail again. No second life shall be taken. I will rectify my error. For, see you, there must have been an error. Somewhere there has been a lack of order and method in my usually so well-arranged ideas. I will start again. Yes, I will start at the beginning, and this time I will not fail. You really think, then, I said, that Nick Buckley's life is still in danger? My friend, for what other reason did I send her to this nursing home? Or oh, then it wasn't the shock. <laughs> the shock? <laughs> One can recover from shock as well in one's own home as in a nursing home. Better, for that matter. It is not amusing there, the floors of green linoleum, the conversation of the nurses, the meals on trays, the ceaseless washing. No, no. It is for safety, and safety only. I take the doctor into my confidence. He agrees. 
he will make all arrangements. No one, mon ami, not even her dearest friend, will be admitted to see Miss Buckley. You and I are the only ones permitted. Pour les autres, eh bien. Doctor's orders, they will be told. A phrase very convenient, and not one to begin said. Yes, I said. Only... Only what, Hastings? Well, that can't go on forever. A very true observation. But it gives us a little breathing space, and you realize, do you not, that the character of our operations has changed. In what way? Our original task was to ensure the safety of Mamselle. Our task now is a much simpler one, a task with which we are well acquainted. It is neither more nor less than the hunting down of a murderer. You call that simpler? Certainly it is simpler. The murderer has, as I said the other day, signed his name to the crime. He has come out into the open. You don't think... I hesitated, then went on. You don't think that the police are right, that this is the work of a madman, some wandering lunatic with a homicidal mania? I am more than ever convinced that such is not the case. You really think that... I stopped. Poirot took up my sentence, speaking very gravely. That the murderer is someone in Mademoiselle's own circle. Yes, mon ami, I do. But surely last night must almost rule out that possibility. We were all together, and... He interrupted. Could you swear, Hastings, that any particular person had never left our little company there on the edge of the cliff? Is there any one person there whom you could swear you had seen all the time? No, I said slowly, struck by his words. I don't think I could. It was dark. We all moved about, more or less. On different occasions I noticed Mrs. Rice, Lazarus, you, Croft, Vise. But all the time, no. Poirot nodded his head. Exactly. It would be a matter of a very few minutes. The two girls go to the house. The murderer slips away unnoticed. Hides behind that sycamore tree in the middle of the lawn. Nick Buckley, or so he thinks, comes out of the window. Passes within a foot of him. He fires three shots in rapid succession. Three, I interjected. Yes. He was taking no chances this time. We found three bullets in the body. Well, that was risky, wasn't it? Less risky in all probability than one shot would have been. A Mauser pistol does not make a great deal of noise. It would resemble more or less the popping of the fireworks and blend in very well with the noise of them. Did you find the pistol? I asked. No. And there, Hastings, lies, to my mind, the indisputable proof that no stranger is responsible for this. We agree, do we not, that Miss Buckley's own pistol was taken in the first place for one reason only, to give her death the appearance of suicide? Yes. That is the only possible reason, is it not? But now, you observe, there is no pretense of suicide. The murderer knows that we should not any longer be deceived by it. He knows, in fact, what we know. I reflected, admitting to myself the logic of Poirot's deduction. What did he do with the pistol, do you think? Poirot shrugged his shoulders. For that, it is difficult to say. But the sea was exceedingly handy. A good toss of the arm and the pistol sinks, never to be recovered. We cannot, of course, be absolutely sure, but that is what I should have done. His matter-of-fact tone made me shiver a little. Do you think... Do you think he realized that he'd killed the wrong person? I am quite sure he did not, said Poirot grimly. Yes, that must have been an unpleasant little surprise for him when he learnt the truth. To keep his face and betray nothing, it cannot have been easy. At that moment I bethought myself of the strange attitude of the maid, Ellen. I gave Poirot an account of her peculiar demeanour. He seemed very interested. She betrayed surprise, did she? That it was Maggie who was dead. Great surprise. That is curious. And yet the fact of a tragedy was clearly not a surprise to her. Yes, there is something there that must be looked into. Who is she, this Ellen? So quiet, so respectable in the English manner. Could it be she who... He broke off. If you are going to include the accidents, I said... Surely it would take a man to have rolled that heavy boulder down the cliff. Not necessarily. It is very largely a question of leverage. Oh, yes, it could be done. He continued his slow pacing up and down the room. Anyone who was at End House last night comes under suspicion. But those guests? No. 
I do not think it was one of them. For the most part, I should say, they were mere acquaintances. There was no intimacy between them and the young mistress of the house. Charles Vyse was there, I remarked. Yes, we must not forget him. He is logically our strongest suspect. He made a gesture of despair and threw himself into a chair opposite mine. Voila! It is always that we come back to motive. We must find the motive if we are to understand this crime. And it is there, Hastings, that I am continually baffled. Who can possibly have a motive for doing away with Mademoiselle Nick? I have let myself go to the most absurd suppositions. I, Hercule Poirot, have descended to the most ignominious flights of fancy. I have adopted the mentality of the cheap thriller, the grandfather, the old Nick, he who is supposed to have gambled his money away. Did he really do so? I have asked myself. Did he, on the contrary, hide it away? Is it hidden somewhere in End House, buried somewhere in the grounds? With that end in view, I am ashamed to say it. I inquired of Mademoiselle Nick whether there had ever been any offers to buy the house. Do you know, Poirot, I said, I call that rather a bright idea. There may be something in it. Poirot groaned. You would say that. It would appeal, I knew, to your romantic but slightly mediocre mind. Buried treasure, yes, you would enjoy that idea. Well, I don't see why not, because, my friend, the more prosaic explanation is nearly always more probable. End of Disc 2